Welcome back to the Conference Center and Global Specs Aerospace Technology Online Trade Show and Event. I'm Jim Brennan. A new automated inspection solution employed by Airbus has reduced inspection time more than 80 percent. It was developed to inspect the forward section of an aircraft fuselage, but the solution can adapt to changes in the inspection conditions, the inspection process, or other aircraft models. And in our next presentation, you'll learn how an automated metrology solution for fuselage assembly drastically reduced inspection and operator training time at Airbus. You'll discover how direct integration into a manufacturing statistical process control system database eliminates potential errors. And in addition, you'll understand why the simplified inspection process limits the need for direct intervention by a metrology expert. But first, I'd like to invite you to submit your questions at any point during this presentation by using the Enter Question and Submit button at the base of this video console. You can also download a copy of the PowerPoint for easy reference and note-taking by clicking on the button labeled Download PPT. Now, our next speaker is Director of Engineering at Build It Software and Solutions, and he oversees the company's product development process. So please join me in welcoming Mathieu Dubé-Dallaire to our Global Spec online trade show and event. Thanks, Jim. Um, well, I'm going to talk about uh, a project that we did with Airbus uh, in Saint-Nazaire in France uh, with, uh, with regards to automating um, a couple of uh, inspection and assembly stations with, uh, with our solutions, and hopefully you'll find this interesting. So the application itself was really centered around two distinct fields uh, or two distinct uh, sorts of applications. Uh, one was really to sort of automate the metrology itself uh, by uh, providing a solution that could automate the inspection of fuselage sections, uh, mainly the interface part of the different fuselage sections uh, to ensure that they could be assembled together. And uh, this process was mainly uh, done for the A400M and the A380 uh, for the front section, front fuselage sections and mid sections as well. Uh, in this process, uh, we really had to have uh, a solution that could measure a set of inspection points that, uh, in this case, were fairly well defined and actually the reflectors used to measure these points were already pre-mounted on the interface prior to the inspection beginning. And the deviations or the, the deviations of those uh, reference points were reported uh, relative to the location of the different panel sections on which the different uh, tooling uh, uh, would attach on, on the surface itself. And the second process that we did was really more of an automated assembly solution. Uh, and that's something that we did more for the, 300, uh, the A330 GMF, which is sort of a freighter version of the, uh, the 330. And in this case, uh, it's not really measuring after the fact, but we were really involved in the assembly process itself. And uh, in this case, the operator uh, would, was guided to position the components correctly. Uh, using uh, the various tooling points that we had. So we were measuring essentially while the part was being assembled on the, uh, on the aircraft section itself. And in this case, the inspection was done on panels uh, using roughly defined uh, inspection areas. So the tooling was not directly attached to the part itself, but we had general areas and we wanted to inspect the surface at these rough locations to make sure that the, uh, that the sub-assemblies were positioned correctly. Now, uh, in terms of the, what was driving sort of this change of methods, because obviously they've been doing that uh, for a while in the past, but they wanted to have a new solution to do that. And uh, what was driving this change was that really they wanted to have a solution that was really driven by the operators on the shop floor and not have to rely on metrology experts or people who were maybe hard to get by, uh, on the shop floor at any given moment. Uh, so actually the, the, the operators themselves had to be able to manipulate and, and use the solution itself. So it, has, it had obviously to be uh, easy to use for them because obviously they don't necessarily have the same level of uh, training and background in metrology as the experts would, would have. Um, and we had to have sort of simplified representations of the results and have uh, graphical and sort of tabular formats for these results. Uh, we had to provide uh, immediate validation of the measurements and provide the results uh, really on the fly in real time and not depend uh, basically on the secondary post-processing uh, to generate the results so that obviously the operators would know right away if it's good or if it's bad. And again, because of the different varial, uh, variable skill levels of the operators, it had to be fairly uh, fault tolerant and resilient, be, being able to pick, pick itself back up or continue. Uh, following an error from the operator and detect and basically continue from uh, after those errors. The solution also had to be uh, custom tailored 
uh, although still flexible. So it had cu custom tailored to the processes at Airbus, but flexible enough to allow uh, use on different stations, which can have va well varying processes within within some some uh, some margin, obviously. So we have in this case uh, multiple processes and multiple stations. So obviously, as I mentioned before, we were dealing with uh, three different aircraft models: the 400M, the 380, and the 330 GMF. Uh, but even within these three stations, we had uh, different processes. So let's say for the 400M, we might have had two or three different inspection processes that we had to go through. So the solution had to be flexible enough to allow uh, to support these uh, different processes as, as they went along. Uh, the solution also had to be able to process both a geometric and surface-based measurements. So measuring X, Y, Z deviations, but also uh, deviations according to various reference surfaces on the aircraft, which are not necessarily just uh, purely XYZ coordinates, but actually surfaces. So we had to do projection and evaluation to surfaces. Obviously, all of that had to be done in real time as well. And obviously, the end goal and, and, and the goal, I guess, from higher up would be to uh, speed up the cycle time or the inspection time so that they can produce these uh, sections faster. Now, some of the constraints that we had in trying to uh, implement a solution uh, was that obviously since we need to analyze to the reference surfaces of the aircraft and not just provide XYZ coordinates, uh, we needed to be able to bring in uh, to the solution the actual CAD model of the sections under inspection. And these CAD models were available only in the native format, uh, in this case, uh, CATIA 5 models. Uh, and we had to use the actual official master models and not any pared down versions so that we were, would be able to uh, easily or seamlessly bring in update or updated versions of the models without having to incur extra work on Airbus's uh, side. And also, uh, because the different stations were sometimes configured differently in terms of the hardware that they used, we had to support uh, different device types, so different ferro trackers, different models of ferro trackers, and also support, uh, in the case of the 330M, uh, sorry, the 330 GMF uh, support uh, Leica tracker uh, with a T probe as well. Now the architecture that was devised was something that relied on our existing metrology solution, which is uh, build it, uh, which already has its own uh, internal architecture to drive and to connect it to the various devices. But we devised a basically a, a, a HMI or human machine interface or graphical user interfaces, uh, however you want to call it. But we devised a simplified user interface that would sit on top of that of our existing metrology solution to present, say, a, a more uh, user friendly. Um, facade for, for our software uh, and for the solution. And that tool uh, used a set of uh, typically XML files, but a set of input files, and it generated a set of output files according to the Airbus specification. So Airbus would codify the processes and what needed to be measured in a set of input files read by the solution, which would drive the metrology software underneath. And then the output of that is going to be a, another set of files that they're going to be able to use and, and push further down the line into their production uh, systems. We're going to talk about that in just a while. Now, this is a, a view of our uh, of the let's say the simplified user interface that we've devised. You can see this is a sort of a simplified representation of the uh, fuselage section that is under inspection. You can see there's a really co a colorful feedback, and if the points are inside or outside of tolerance if the point has yet to be measured and so on. And one of the imported aspects, if you look at the uh, bottom right corner, you can see there are four uh, buttons, basically play, pause, stop, and save, which are you know, fairly easy for anybody to understand. And these are the four main buttons that the operator is going to be uh, using to drive the, uh, the inspection. So as you can understand, most of the process itself is automated. And the user simply press play, pause if he needs to adjust something on the uh, on the section itself, and then it can continue measuring. So there's no complex interaction, really, as much as possible, simplified down to these four different actions. We had a different view in the case uh, of the 380 and the 330, where there's actual uh, assembly that had to be done with the software. So we needed to provide real-time feedback for the positioning of sub-assemblies. So in that case, we had a special view that would show in real-time the deviations so that the operator could position the sub-assemblies correctly. Uh, in the main, on the main aircraft section, and then once the, uh, everything was positioned correctly, all the numbers would line up in, gra uh, in green, and then you could move on to the next point. 
And let's say for, for going down, if there were some problems that were detected or if the operator wanted to have some more information or if, let's say, there was an error and then a metrology expert will have to come in and sort of try to validate if the measurement was done correctly or if they can proceed uh, regardless of the, uh, of the official, officially reported error, uh, we had sort of a more tabular uh, reporting format that gave a list of all of the theoretical coordinates, the actually measured coordinates, the deviations according to the XYZ, the deviations according to the surfaces, and all sorts of other information from the data collection itself that could be easily reviewed and provided additional feedback if we wanted to drill down a bit further into the results. On that. So that's an, a third view that we had in the software. Now, uh, I mentioned before we had a set of input files and output files now. The input files, as I mentioned again uh, before, one of the requirements with that was that we would be able to bring in the native CAD files, in this case again, CATIA 5, uh, V5 files. Uh, so that was one of the input files, obviously, the, the CAD file itself. And these files were used to uh, bring in the surface geometry that we would use to uh, do the, uh, the analysis for the, the deviations to those surfaces. We had a separate file uh, for the points themselves, the points to be measured, and that was an XML-based file, and we used that to store all of the measurement-related parameters like the coordinates, the offsets from the tooling, the probe offsets. Uh, if we had to perform a search, uh, let's say the positioning wasn't uh, always perfect, if we had to perform a spiral search to locate the targets, the reflective targets, then the search radius uh, would be uh, into that file as well. So we define all of the various parameters that could be necessary for the measurement itself into that separate XML file. And so that was not part of the initial CAD file, although it could have been at one point. But uh, because of the additional information that we required, we decided to split that off into a separate file. Uh, in that point file, uh, the points are grouped into different sets uh, so let's say we would have the anchor points, the points used uh, for the alignment. So aligning uh, is essentially uh, locating the measurement, uh, the tracker, uh, so the measurement device relative to the part that is under inspection. So we have points that are used as reference points on the, um, on the structure itself that we would measure. Uh, so these would be the alignment points. And then we would have all the various points that were under inspection. So points on the panels, on the rails, on the stringers, on the nose fairing itself, on the belly fairing. So we could have a list of different points grouped by essentially their function or how they should be measured by the software. So it was fairly easy for the operators, or actually not the operators, but the, the measurement uh, experts, if they wanted to add a point for measurement, they would simply add a point within that list and it would automatically be taken into account whenever we got to the process we measure, for example, the panel points. If we added a point there, it would also uh, simply be measured as soon as we got there without any additional modifications to the process itself. And now one thing to note is that the uh, point file, the XML file, is identical for both input and output, so the results. Uh, so the, in the same file, uh, we have all of the information required for the measurement, but we also store, once the measurement is done, we also store all of the results, so the coordinates that were actually measured, and then any of the deviations that were computed to the surfaces or th to the theoretical coordinates would be also stored in the XML file. Um, and it's also used to store any process information other than the measurements. For example, the result of the different alignments, if we've got uh, deviations that are, uh, well, the, the deviation values, RMS or error values from the resulting from the alignment, and anything basically around the process but not specifically, to, specifically tied to a point would be in its own location in, uh, in the point file, so the basically becoming the, its own result file. Now with the process file, uh, that's a separate XML file that is used to define the process. And we have a set of functions that are available uh, to the user interface that can be mixed and matched. And this is really the key in providing sort of the flexibility um, for the different processes and also for the different structures, the different airplanes structures that we were able to support. So with those different set of commands, we were able to basically build up a specific process uh, file for each of the actual measurement processes or, or uh, assembly uh, processes that we need to do. In those process files, uh, essentially we had uh, everything, the, the commands grouped into sections. So we had a prologue section which was executed as soon as the uh, HMI was started. And then, for example, that prologue would typically do things like load the CAD file, load the point file, 
uh, connect and initialize the measurement devices. And we had, as a counterpoint to that, we had the epilogue that was uh, the section that was run when we pressed the save button in the interface. Um, so that would typically just save all the different files, and we'll come to that a bit later, uh, would also disconnect and, uh, well, basically do any cleanup it had to do at this point. And any other sections that were defined uh, within the process file were the section that would be executed in order when we press the play button on the interface. Now there is, uh, although the, the process file is sort of a top-down kind of process, uh, there is some uh, conditional execution of section that is also possible. So we had, we had the ability to have some variations within even the same process to allow some variations in the process uh, depending on, depending on uh, external conditions or uh, different choices or, or, or cases that the operator had to measure. If they wanted to measure only a subset, for example, of, of the whole process, uh, they could do that as well. Now as part of the process file, uh, as I mentioned, we had a set of 38 uh, different uh, commands that we could mix and match. Uh, now out of those commands, we had uh, four different commands that could be used uh, for the actual uh, measurement themselves. Uh, we had the first command was sort of the fully automatic uh, measurement mode where we would aim to a reflector, aim the tracker to a reflector at the theoretical coordinates, uh, do a spiral search, to find the nearest reflector. Obviously, we could be a couple of millimeters off from the theoretical coordinates. So search for that, the nearest reflector, and then automatically measure that point, and then move on to the second reflector and third reflector, and so on. So that would be a fully automatic process, as we've done with, uh, for example, the 400M uh, was done in that manner. Uh, the second measurement mode we had was a sort of a more manual approach uh, called track, where we would basically have the tracker sort of follow a reflector that would be in hand, in the hand of the operators moving around, and then the operator would set down the reflector at a given location, and then we would measure at that point, and then indicate to the operator that he could move on to the next point. And so, and what we do, we would use that command typically more at the earlier stage or at the beginning of a process to measure, uh, let's say, three or four points, just to establish sort of a, a reference position. So that would be in the case where we didn't know beforehand where the measurement devices were located relative to the structure if we have a portable inspection uh, station or something like that, uh, then we would simply measure three or four points using that mode. And then once we knew uh, where the tracker was positioned relative to the, the structure, then we could switch and then measure all of the other points uh, using aim, uh, automatic aim since we knew uh, now where, we, uh, where the tracker is located relative to the structure. Now the last two modes was, uh, were watch point and watch group, and these are the two me methods that were used uh, when we had to do uh, automated assembly or, or measurement assisted assembly. Um, so these are the modes that we would use when we wanted to provide real-time feedback in, uh, with the positioning of the probe so that we could automatically, either with the watch point, sort of the, the automatic mode, it would automatically aim to a target, would search for the target, and then it would wait, just providing the real-time deviation so that the operator could adjust the positioning of the subassembly at that, uh, at that location, and then just manually click the measure, and then we would take the coordinates, record that, and then we'd move on to the next point. So that it's fairly similar to the aim command, but it just provides uh, a, a amount of time so that the user can position the subassembly, and it's, it doesn't simply measure the point and move on. And then the last one was more of a, called watched group, uh, is uh, similar again, so it does provide the real-time deviation information so that uh, the operator can position sub-assemblies. Uh, but what it does is it, we give it a whole set of points, and then the operator can move around with a reflector, or uh, in the specific case where it was used here at the, with the 330, uh, with a T-probe, and then he could just measure, and automatically we would find the nearest point where we were located and then provide the deviation information relative to that nearest point. And then the operator would measure, once he's satisfied with the positioning and the adjustments, he would measure all the points and then the command would move on as soon as the operator had measured all of the uh, points within that group. Now this is uh, the first, one of the first processes, this is an example process that we've done with a 400M, uh, just to give you an idea of how the different commands can be assembled together to provide a, a workable process file. Uh, so with the 400M 
on one of the fuselage sections, what we do is essentially when we initialize the tracker at the beginning, we first perform a backside or two-face check on both trackers just to establish that the, uh, the calibration of the trackers is still uh, acceptable. Uh, and then what we do is then we measure anchor points uh, that are located really, not really on the structure itself, but are uh, located uh, on uh, the floor and on uh, uh, concrete beams all around the uh, inspection station. And then we measure those points from both the front and back trackers because in this process here we actually had two trackers to measure each side of the fuselage section. So one was sitting at the front of the section, the other one was sitting at the back. So we would measure a set of common points so that we could locate relative to each other where the two trackers were located. And then after that we'd measure uh, the gravity vector, we'd measure points a, ref a set of reference points on the structure itself and then we would uh, align both trackers together now forming sort of a rigid, uh, a rigid set of trackers. We would align both together to the structure and then we would perform the actual inspection which would be to inspect uh, around 25 points on the skin of the surface and analyze or analyze the location of those points uh, to the theoretical surfaces of the, uh, of the fuselage sections. And then we would adjust the alignment uh, along the longitudinal axis of the structure and then uh, measure a another set of points on the stringers and then in this case we would not compare to the actual surfaces but we would compare uh, to the theoretical, uh, actually no sorry, with the stringers it's also with regards to the surfaces and we would obviously compute uh, uh, taking into account the probe offsets and the tooling offsets, all that done on the fly to provide immediate feedback to the operators. Now in the second process of the A400M, it's essentially the same set of uh, commands that we would use in the process uh, with one difference is that the alignment instead of being just a simple best fit to a, a set of four or five reference points, we would perform an actual 3-2-1 alignment uh, using reference points, so uh, using the hinge line in the front of the fuselage. So the alignment method would be slightly different in this case, but the rest of the process is fairly similar for, the, for that second process on the A400M. Now on the 380, again, we would reuse a lot of the basic, same basic uh, commands and process components that we had done before. Uh, we've added, as I mentioned before, in that case for the 380, we've added the possibility for a, a set of points, actually, uh, to be able to adjust those in, as part of the process to do adjustment of the position of those points. So at the end of the process, once we've measured, uh, as we did with the 400, a, a number of points on the skin and on the rails, uh, we would also have two points that we would uh, need to position as part of the process. So we would switch into what we call the sort of the watch point mode, as I defined before, where we would show the real-time deviations of those points so that the operator could, could finalize the positioning of those points as part of the measurement process. Now for the 330 uh, GMF, we have uh, a different, uh, uh, different kind of process. It's more of a measurement assist assisted assembly uh, kind of process. Uh, so not just doing the inspection but actually performing the, uh, the installation of the front fairing on the aircraft and guiding the operator in doing that process and then obviously finishing that with an actual inspection. But, uh, so what we would do would be to align to the structure itself and then guide the operators uh, using, using a set of, of fixed target points. The, uh, the operator would move around uh, with a T-probe in this case, would move around the structure finalizing using turnbuckles and positioning uh, turnbuckles and tie rods, positioning the, uh, the front fairing and then once he's happy we'd lock everything down, he puts the skin on and then we'd go around a second pass and do a sort of a final inspection on the structure itself, on the, on the surfaces itself uh, to make sure that everything was positioned uh, correctly in that process. So whereas the other processes are more straightforward ins uh, in inspection processes, in the case of the 330 GMF, we have a process where we're more uh, guiding the operators to perform the positioning of the front fairing. So it's more of a, a measurement assisted assembly in this case. So these are for the different kind of uh, input files that we've got. So just to recap, we have the CAD file, we have the point file, and we had uh, the process file, which could be obviously adapted for the different processes that we would want to do. Now, on the output side, 
we generated a number of different files uh, on the output once the process was completed and the operator was satisfied with what we saw, what he saw in the user interface, he would press the save button and at that point we would generate uh, a PDF report which was essentially taking the same kind of format that we had in the user interface and save that to a PDF file just to be available and to be able to show that to the metrology experts if they came by. And we also generate sort of a machine readable uh, statistical process control file or actually a file compatible with their statistical process control uh, system so that they could directly input that into their uh, uh, the plant uh, management software for further processing down the line and actual reporting to the other divisions of Airbus where they would send the actual structures for final assembly. We also generate a log file if anything goes wrong and the, or the metrology specialist wants to revise the process, make sure that everything was done according to what he expected. Uh, the log file would be there for further diagnostics if anything was required later down the road. Uh, and then obviously we generate the XML file, the result file that I mentioned before, uh, providing all of the results and all the, the process results and all of the measurement results in a raw form. So basically everything would be contained in that XML. Everything they actually required for the process to go down the line would be in the SPC compatible file. And then the PDF would be just be a user-friendly way to show what we had already shown in the user interface itself directly uh, once the process is finished. Now other features of the solution was that uh, it integrates with uh, some shop floor automation system uh, and this is typically used uh, in this case uh, with uh, for the, uh, the anchor points. Uh, they had a system to automatically rotate uh, so essentially if you can if you can imagine the reflector it's a uh, basically a ball with a mirror mounted inside and the mirror only has uh, at about the 30 degree angle of view. So if we want to measure from that same uh, reflector from both front and back, we actually have to turn the reflector so it faces front and then it faces the back tracker. Uh, so they had a system really to push the automation for even further, they had a system to automatically rotate those targets towards the front and then towards the back. And as part of our process, we interfaced with the floor, uh, shop floor automation system to drive uh, the motors to rotate to the front and to the back really seamlessly as part of the process. So it, it wasn't a separate kind of operation that the operators had to do. It was all driven directly from uh, the solution that we provided. Uh, obviously, I mentioned before, it had to be fairly robust since it was targeted for operators. So the m other important feature was really with regards to error handling, um, making sure that the process was followed is one thing but making sure that it was executed correctly is another so we had to check for uh, RMS errors on the different measurements and alignments making sure that we are actually measuring the right points and that there's no let's say if uh, somebody was walking on the structure as we measured the points it would induce some vibration that would invalidate the measurement so we had to sort of de detect uh, scenarios like that and then provide visual and audio feedback if there's any problems to notify the operator that something goes wrong and uh, something's wrong and they had to start over again uh, that part of the process. Not start over from the beginning, but just start over that measurement. Uh, allowing, as I mentioned, remeasuring the points. And uh, another thing that we did is as because the operator can pause the process, the execution of the process, uh, if the process takes longer than a, a set period of time, uh, we wanted to all have the system automatically check back the reference point that you used at the beginning just to make sure that there was no drift over time. If, for example, the process was left on pause for a number of hours, let's say for a break, uh, lunch break, and in that period of time somebody kicked the tracker uh, or, kicked the, the, or moved around the structure or kicked the tracker or the measurement device, uh, so we wanted to automatically trigger those events, let's say if the process was taking longer than half an hour, which it shouldn't, but if it takes longer than half an hour, it would automatically measure those points and it would generate an error if there was some drift detected from the beginning. And uh, the user interface also has uh, um, a mechanism to recognize different roles uh, for the different users that are allowed to, to, uh, to operate it and then provide a different set of overrides or a different kind of information depending if it's a simple operator doing the measurement or if it's a metrology expert, we'd want to show a little bit more information and allow them to some override some of the errors that were uh, possible with the system, whereas operators didn't have the, the possibility of overriding anything. And then we'd have the maintenance people uh, maybe there to change some of the settings on the measurement devices so they have uh, access to a different set of functions as well within the user interface. 
Now the result, uh, all the result of all that work is that we had a solution that was really in the end operator driven and not expert driven as it had been in the past. Uh, I mean, their existing system was really driven by, by the metrology experts. Now it was really driven by the operators. So they're in charge of the whole inspection process and really the training for these operators is uh, in order of, of, of four hours only. So half a day training and they're able to use the system because it's very simple. We provide a sort of a simplified view of the, of, of the process. Um, the solution is, is really tailored to the needs of Airbus. So it's a specific solution for Airbus, but it's flexible enough to be used on, for various processes and on various different structures. And it's, uh, because of that flexibility, it's under consideration for other processes in Saint-Nazaire and in other Airbus plants as well. Uh, it ha it's a solution that does both uh, geometric and surface-based uh, evaluation of the deviations, which is a good thing because in the past they were able to do sort of the geometric deviations, but the surface-based deviation was required post-processing in, in a separate CAD software that had to be done later on and took quite a bit of time. Now we provide everything real-time that all of the deviations are shown so that the operator knows right away if something is wrong or if the structure is right. And I guess for the, again, for management, the best gain was really the speed up in cycle time. So they went down from 12 hours of work and including hours by an expert down to two hours. So that's a six fold improvement in time. Uh, and then those two hours were strictly by the operators. Uh, so it was really a, a resounding success. And that obviously that's why it was uh, deployed on, on further stations. So back to you, if you have any questions, uh, I guess we have some time. Well, we do have some time, and we have several questions already waiting for you. This first one asks, what other applications and industries can benefit from such solutions? Well, I guess uh, anything that requires sort of a fairly high level of precision, uh, but it's particularly well suited to, uh, let's say, large parts that are produced in somewhat low volumes in this case. But uh, I guess uh, mainly aerospace and defense would be the most common applications, but anything from transportation, train buses, or even heavy machinery, uh, all the way to energy, let's say windmill and turbines, would be uh, different uh, applications that could benefit from that. Okay, next up we have, what would you say are the trends in the field of large-scale metrology? Well, I would say the main thing is uh, working around the limitations that are imposed sort of by the size uh, of what needs to be inspected. Let's say in, in large-scale metrology, the parts are, are so large that the, uh, you can't really inspect them in a dedicated metrology room or using uh, traditional equipment like a, a fixed CMM, uh, a coordinate measuring machine. Um, so it's not really practical. It, it, it's even sometimes uh, completely impossible. Um, now the first generation of, of portable CMMs, uh, used, uh, they, they addressed sort of uh, the problem, but they had limited accuracy, at least compared to the fixed CMMs now. Uh, it wasn't so much an issue in this case because uh, obviously dealing with large uh, structures, uh, Typically, we have also larger tolerances, so the, 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 these equipments could be used still. But now what we see is that the tolerances really shrink down uh, because there's really a push to improve the processes and the efficiency uh, and to provide a higher accuracy and have something that's more robust. So that's really driving sort of the, the requirements on the portable devices now. Uh, and I think the sort of the interest in uh, also non-contact measurement devices, so we've typically work with arms and uh, laser trackers that you have to have actually a touch probe, a probe that would actually touch the, first, the surface under inspection. But now there's really some interest in things like laser scanners that, um, for which the accuracy continues to improve. Because that was one of the things that it, was not, it wasn't as, that great in, uh, back then, but now really we see that laser trackers keep improvement. Um, and we see sort of uh, with uh, the use of composite structures, uh, mainly in aeronautics, and having complex freeform surfaces, uh, it, it really is something that's driving the, the adoption for these uh, kind of uh, measurement devices. Okay, this next one asks, do you see automation as a general trend in metrology? Oh, I mean, definitely. I mean, it, it's not just for large-scale metrology, but for all sorts of applications. Now, obviously, the, uh, the application we've just shown, uh, it, it really is, uh, I mean, talking about something that's fully customized. Uh, I mean, this is really something that's more applicable for a fairly involved process uh, where we have large things that takes a lot of time to do. Um, and in this case, you know, the customization costs are somewhat negligible uh, relative to the process costs themselves. 
uh, so the benefits uh, from these uh, these changes can be uh, quite interesting for, for different or organizations. But uh, I think generally speaking, there's certainly a push in the industry to sort of automate the measurement and the resulting uh, analysis as much as possible. And I think this is driven not so much by the speed that can be gained, but by the need to have something that's uh, reproducible and well-defined and that we can have something that's fairly systematic uh, and then can be ar executed by, the, by, uh, by operators. Okay, next up. How has that shifted the measurement responsibilities received by the people involved? Well, I think uh, from what I've seen uh, at Airbus, I think uh, it, everyone would agree that it's, it's pretty much a good thing. It, it allows uh, the metrology specialists sort of concentrate on the process, on defining and improving the process, uh, reacting to changes in the workflow and the, the requirements for production. And I think it gives the operators a sort of a larger ownership of the process, uh, albeit in a controlled fashion. Uh, but I think this is really empowering for them as well. Well, Matt, too, we need to wind things up. I want to thank you for taking the time to answer our attendees' questions. We appreciate it. Thank you, Jim. It's, my, it's been my pleasure. Providing our users with easy access to valuable information is a hallmark of GlobalSpec, and that's why we're emphasizing our focus on electronics with the recent launch of GlobalSpec Electronics. It's an enhancement of our website with the specific needs of electronic component and product designers in mind. On it, you'll find tools, insights, and applications to aid in your design research and problem solving because it's rich with resources. And this new area of our site features direct access to our electronics design center, more than 20 newsletters dedicated to electronics, detailed directories of components and suppliers, new product alerts, our exclusive electronics part finder, and many other features. It's one more way GlobalSpec delivers what you need to get your work done. And in fact, you can stay up to speed every day with information delivered right to your inbox. GlobalSpec offers more than 60 online publications filled with the latest advances in your area of expertise. So I invite you to sign up for our e-newsletter and our product alerts to get the latest innovations to hit the market. You can find both of these links in the Resource Center under GlobalSpec Resources and then click General. Now GlobalSpec is always looking for speakers to share their expertise, so if you'd like to be considered as a speaker at one of our events, you can find the speaker submittal form right here on our website. Just look for the link labeled events and then click on speaking opportunities. And at the end of each session, please take a moment to complete the survey by clicking the take survey button on your video, uh, video console. It's a good way to let our speakers know how they did today and provide feedback that helps us improve the quality of our global spec e events, making them an even better investment of your time. Up next at 3 o'clock Eastern Time, Scott Metcalf. He's with Wittenstein. He'll be discussing vibration advances for helicopter simulators. We will alert you via our scrolling marquee at the bottom of your screen about five minutes prior to the start of this presentation so you won't miss it. In the meantime, take this time to chat with your peers and industry experts gathering in the exhibit hall and networking lounge, and I'll look forward to seeing you back here at 3 p.m. Eastern Time.